Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. I've got set out here a bunch of different modules that I've collected over the years for the Sharp PC-1500, also known as the Radio Shack TRS-80 PC-2. Uh, these come in different flavors. We've got RAM modules and a special funky type of RAM module that acts like ROM and some actual ROM modules. And I really wanted to see what was on these ROM modules and, you know, to try to find a way to do that. So I thought first we would kind of look at these individual modules and the types of them and just see what they are. And then we'll see if we can't find a way to discover what's on these ROM modules. Let's get started. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. They offer an excellent quick turn PCB prototyping service, which now has a free upgrade to the 150-160 temperature range. They also offer a wide range of services that allow you to go from idea to a finished product, including CNC machining, 3D printing, injection molding, PCB assembly. Go on over to pcbway.com slash OEM to find out more. The PC1500 or TRS-80 PC2 and a couple of different expansion options. One was the 60 pin connector on the side and some peripherals plugged in here as well as third party companies made program modules that would plug in there. And there is also this little slot on the back. This is a 40 pin connector here and was intended for expansion RAM modules like this 4K module from Radio Shack. Uh, there was also 8K RAM modules. Here is a sharp version of that module. And you notice that these are small and they just drop down in here and you slip them in like that and you can put the cover back on. And when they got up to the 16K module, evidently they needed a little more room. They made a much fancier cartridge here. So when you plug this in, this retracts to reveal the connector. It has a backup battery inside with a switch. You can turn it on so it right protects it. And you slip this in and there is a little filler piece that goes in behind it like so. And next up we have the CE160. Now this is very similar to this guy. It is a RAM module with a battery. Uh, this one has the battery removed. You see it there's just a uh, 4138 logic chip in there, uh, some other glue logic and a couple RAM chips on there. That's all there is to this guy. And you couldn't, you can't program these in your computer. You have to buy a special programmer for it. So if you were a company releasing software on these guys that you might want to update like an insurance company, something like that. You could buy the programmer for these guys, program it, send it out, and although it's a RAM module, it's got a battery, uh, it is going to act like ROM when you plug it into the computer here. Now, I would assume uh, these are still together and still have the battery inside. I would guess that these are dead. There's no programs left on these, but we will have a peek at them and see. And then you have ROM modules. Uh, I got this ROM module kind of in this dilapidated state like this and what looks kind of like a homemade cover for it. Uh, so we have a 27256 EEPROM, uh, an inverter here to uh, invert some of the control logic to enable the, the chip, and a little circuit board that's marked Pygmy Computer Systems 1985. I've tried to contact these folks in the past and they no longer seem to be around. They were out of Florida in the USA. And there is also this Logic Junior 2 module. Now on this one the case looks glued together. It did not want to pop apart easily. 
So, um, I couldn't figure out what was inside directly. And that set me on the course of trying to find a way to figure out what was in these EPROMs or what was on the CE-160s. Um, you can write basic programs to these, but they are protected from being viewed or listed. So that begs the question, how can you see it and know what's on there? And that is a question I hope we can answer, oops, in the course of this video. So let's see how we might be able to do that. first thing I thought is maybe we can use some extremely high magnification and see the ones and zeros on the surface of the EEPROM. Let's give it a try. Mm. Nope. Can't see the ones and zeros on there. Darn. Well, maybe we can conjure the code out of this. Reveal your secrets. <gasps> what does it say? Greetings, Mr. Sleeth presents his compliments to Haybert and begs him to keep his abnormally large nose out of other people's code. Well, how rude. I guess that didn't work either. Darn. Since I couldn't see the bits or magically conjure the program forth, the next best option was to do some actual research. Um, on the French forum Silicium, I found this post talking about how to dump such a module. And here they're saying uh, if you have the CE150 cassette interface, you can save it as an audio file and then use a program to convert that to the digital form and then you'll be able to look at it. And I thought, well, rather than going through that rigmarole, I can use the CE158 RS232 interface and save it digitally, uh, directly. And the next key bit of information I came across was from PC1500.info where he talks about dumping a ROM module. He has a picture of it here. And he developed a schematic for it. And he found that it uses a flip-flop here to select banks. This particular cart, this uh, administrator cart, had two banks. And he describes the bank switching mechanism here by using a poke to set the state of the flip-flop to change an address line on the EEPROM. So with this information I thought I was ready to try and dump a ROM. Okay here is our dumping setup. We've got our CE150 printer and cassette interface our CE-158 RS-232 interface, and the PC-1500. Of course, these are the uh, TRS-80 versions of those, but either will do. And the first thing I'm going to do is turn the computer on. There's no module in here. I will reset it. And hit clear, and then type new zero. That just does a complete reset on the unit. I will turn it off, flip it upside down, and pop in the Logic Junior 2 cartridge. Just like that. And I need to turn on the RS-232 interface. And I've got an FTDI brand uh, RS-232 to USB cable right here. I like those better. They convert to actual RS-232 levels and they just work. Uh, the printer has no on-off switch when you turn the computer on. You hear the printer jog. 
and it feeds some paper out. The computer turning on actually resets the whole ball of wax. Okay. It's asking for a new zero again. I'm not going to worry because we installed a cartridge. I am not going to worry about it at this point. Okay, the next step is to set up the computer to send the data out over RS-232 rather than to the cassette. And I've got a series of uh, notes here, which you can see on the screen to do that. You may not be able to see this really well, but we'll kind of get zoomed in here. I'll give you a shot. Okay. So, first thing I'm going to do is set the RS-232 parameters on the computer. I'm going to set it to the maximum speed, 2400 baud, 8 bits, no polarity or parity, and one stop bit, enter, and we're going to do out stat, which sets the handshaking. Set that to zero. And then we're going to do a set device. What this does is redirect the cassette output to the RS-232. So if you're familiar with doing stuff in the command line, it works in a similar way. Same idea. Okay. Then we're going to do a C save M which means machine code. Give it a name, we'll just call it logic. Then we'll enter a semicolon. The infra stand is used on the PC-1500 to indicate hex numbers. We're going from address 0000, 0, 0, 0 to 3 FFF, the first 16K. Uh, the basic address space in the PC-1500 starts kind of in the middle and works down to zero. And then we will press enter. And that is dumping to the computer, as you can see. Uh, I'm using cool term here, and I have it set up to recognize 0D line endings. So you can kind of see these are lines of basic code, but they're tokenized, so they're largely gibberish and being 2400 baud it takes a few seconds to dump the whole 16k so now we've copied the uh, memory from 0 to 3 FFF from the PC 1500 to a file on our desktop computer then what uh, the first thing I did was look at the file in a hex editor and through trial and error realized that this 0001 here was the start of the basic listing. This is line one. And I wasn't sure what all this stuff up here was. Uh, this was obviously the file name that I gave it. Uh, some reading uh, from LH Tools, which is the program I use to do the conversion to a basic listing, uh, indicated there was going to be a s header at the beginning of the file from the CE-158, or there would be if you were saved it to cassette even. The header contains the name, uh, how it was saved, address range, that type of thing. Turns out that header is 27 bytes that goes to there. And then we have from this 5.5 down to here, which was something else. And originally I thought, well, maybe this is a basic keyword table, but that just produced gibberish and it didn't make a lot of sense. I then was reading the, the technical manual and I saw here they talked about some uh, what they call ROM status information. It is a ROM header. Now this made a lot of sense because the computer would have to know information about the ROM, including where does the basic program start, what size ROM is it, that type of thing. And that's what this tells us. It gives us the high byte and low byte of the start of basic, the size of the ROM. Uh, and this eighth byte down here, if it's set to zero, will keep us from listing the program. Ah, that is how that works. 
And then I noticed right above this section was this uh, section here on reserve memory configuration. And I thought, oh, well, what if uh, all the stuff in the middle here, I wasn't sure what it was. You know, we've gonna, we're going to have our uh, header right here, the ROM header, but all this other stuff, what if that is the reserve memory area? That kind of made sense. So uh, I created a fragment file for use with uh, the dumping utility from LH Tools. The fragment file tells LH Dump how this particular file is configured. So we're starting at memory address 0. The first 8 bytes here is that header, they're individual bytes. Our reserve memory area starts at 8 and our basic listing starts at 100. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Then I used uh, LHDump, which is part of LHTools uh, from within SIGWIN. Now our long command line here says, using LHDump, the dash uh, D switch here says, for lines that aren't a basic listing include the address, the memory address. Dash Z says there will be a CE158 header, so please ignore it. The dash F says, please use this fragment file. Dash O says this is our output file. And last but not least is our input file. And when you hit enter there, it says, oh yeah, I found a header. Here's the information from that header. And it outputs this file right here. So here is our header. Here is the reserve memory area. That's the reserve buttons that's on the calculator. You can program those to have certain functions. And it looks like not all of them are set in this particular application. And then we get into the basic listing starting at line one. And when I saw all these pokes here, well, I remembered uh, that web page from PC1500.info, which talked about the bank switching. So for the PC1500, uh, we're interested in this 5800 address range, and there are four separate addresses in that range here, 5805, 5809, 5806, and 580A. So we have a four bank ROM. We've got four 16K banks of basic code that make up this ROM to do HVAC related calculations. That would have been quite interesting to program back in the day. I'm guessing maybe he used a text editor on his PC, sent it over to the computer uh, using a CE158. That would have been the easiest way to do it. Uh, it still would have been a little tricky to debug with all this bank switching. Uh, it's quite a feat though. Well, it turns out this particular uh, guy that wrote this is Canadian and he is still actually in this business of writing HVAC software for the PC. And he has a page on his website that kind of list these early programs written for the PC 1500. I will put a link to that uh, down below, along with links to the GitHub and all the other things I've talked about here. Unfortunately, pocket computers were harmed during the filming of this episode. Now I've showed this particular PC too in operation. It's the one I used for the video. I started out with this one. And as you might guess from it being a part, um, I, I burned it up accidentally. Uh, sitting in this empty hole right here is normally this little guy, which is a voltage regulator. This is some surface mount capacitors and transistors and resistors uh, on a little circuit board encapsulated in some sort of epoxy. So um, I, I burnt that up and I did that trying to figure out this module, uh, the one that has the Pygmy software written on it. Uh, it had a bunch of blank space at the beginning of the ROM, which I did not understand. And I thought maybe something was wrong. One of the select lines wasn't right. Something like that because it's a 16K ROM. And I noticed this jumper right here. And I'm going to pop in a couple of pictures I took. That jumper was within a hair's breadth of being connected. And it looks like 
you know, I thought, oh, it was bouncing around in a box and that got broken. So I put a blob of solder on there and without checking to see what that was actually connected to, I plugged that back into this poor PC2 right here and turned it on and let the magic smoke out. And I thought, oh, what did that jumper do? And so I looked and I saw the bottom of the jumper here that connected to this trace. You know, the top connected to this trace. What are those? Oh, that's 5 volts and ground. So I just shorted out the 5 volts, which is why the regulator burned up. And then I had to wonder to myself, why oh why did they put a jumper on there to short out the 5 volts and ground? And why did they have it soldered in there and then cut it and leave it in place almost touching? Who knows? But before soldering that jumper in place, I sure should have looked at where it went. It turns out... Um, the program on here is only 8k in size so the beginning of the ROM just isn't used uh, there's nothing there it's reading back FF and once I realized that it all made sense I was able to just to cut that out of the file and uh, dump it convert it to basic and everything and that's also on the github so um, I'm going to try to remove the epoxy coating from this I had some limited success already with a uh, tantalum capacitor. It has a similar coating and I was able to eat all that off of there. So um, we'll see if we can do the same thing with our little voltage regulator module and see if we can repair it uh, or see if I can find a good replacement off a donor board. Well, I hope you found this interesting. It was a lot of fun figuring out how all this worked and a little frustrating at times trying to put all the pieces together. But in the end, we were able to recover the basic programs, which were on these PC1500 ROM modules for the last 35 years. That was kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting to know that there were so many HVAC applications written for the PC1500. Find out a little more about how these machines were used back in the day. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, well, just leave them in the comment section down there below. I would love to hear from you. Thanks to everyone who helps support the Haybert channel through Patreon and other means. It's greatly appreciated. And until next time.